Thank you all for coming. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome to the first of this year's guest lectures. Today we're happy to have uh, Reed Perkins, who's a professor of environmental studies at Queen's University in Charlotte. Uh, has a background in all sorts of stuff, philosophy, social science, and uh, most importantly, forest hyd hydrology. And uh, today he's going to talk about climate change and some work that he's done uh, in Micronesia on climate change. So Great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I know you had options. Um, as I was coming up to the talk, I was the salmon against the headwaters of the stream. I mean, everyone else was heading out. So I appreciate you coming and finding the time today when everybody else is going home, you're coming here. So that's really, that's fun to see. It's great. So thank you. And thanks too to the sponsoring departments and programs that bring me here and the University of Richmond. Um, it's wonderful. Every day I spend on campus is a good day. Um, maybe you feel the same, but uh, I started today with a run around campus at around 7.30 or 7 o'clock this morning. And it was good because I'd love to see places wake up in the morning. Uh, this is no different. So uh, the women's soccer team was practicing. I don't know if anybody here is on the women's soccer team. They were practicing. I ran by the dining hall. They were sizzling up bacon. It was just a really nice, uh, nice way to start the day. But today we're going to talk about climate change in Micronesia. And does anybody, has anyone ever been to Micronesia? Good because I'm going to tell you lots of things, and hopefully you remember some things at the end. But this is how I want to start. I need three questions before we even begin. I need three questions on anything related to what you think the talk might be about. And that sets a challenge for me, then, to try to make sure I answer at least those three questions over the course of the next 45 minutes. Who has a question? I need three. Sir. What's the uh, average elevation of the islands of Micronesia? Excellent. And I'll store those. I have it queued up. Average elevation is one. What have I done wrong? I haven't even started yet. <laughs> it's my computer. There we go. Uh, next question, sir. How does such a small country begin to combat such a global condition? Yeah, excellent. And ma'am, in the back. Um, I'm interested in the species that look like I don't know that one. Uh, I read that on the island of Palau, there Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. So I was interested in how the climate change might affect the sites of where there's fossils, paleolithic fossils. I may not be able to be your best source for that one. So <laughs> my apologies. And I'm looking for David. Yeah, thank you. There, there, we may have another expert in the room that can help with that. Is there another third question? Ma'am. Um, I was just going to ask why or like how um, climate change is different in Micronesia maybe than other places. You guys are awesome. So why is climate change different in other places? The average elevation of the islands. And the third was, why or how is such a small place combating a global problem? All right, let's get going. So I'm talking today about climate change. And when you go to the place where I'm going to focus on, this is the, this is the sign that, that you see. Welcome to the island of stone money. And I'm going to focus on one small island, but I have to set up the talk before we get there. So when islands sink, a story of climate change. Tim already introduced me. I'll skip this part. And I want to structure the talk around three main components, place, change, and response. And like any story, good stories have characters, right? context, tension, and resolution. Every story follows that same basic pattern, except this one, because there is no final resolution. There is no happy ending. There is no, oh, that's how it works out to this. But there are characters, and there are contexts, and there is tension. Let's start with place. And before we get to place, I have to introduce a really key idea, and that's the notion of vulnerability. Vulnerability is now well documented in the literature as consisting as or a function of exposure. How likely is it are you to receive this external threat? Sensitivity. Once you are exposed to that threat, how sensitive to it are you? And the most important for our conversation is adaptive capacity. Once you've been exposed to the threat, once you've received its, its impact, what do you do next? And that's really your question. What's the adaptive capacity of these small islands? Because let's face it, they're small, they're remote, they're resource limited, their populations are small, they don't have a lot of money. How do they get by? And that's what we're going to be exploring. Because these are spatial questions. And climate change, is, as you, both of you pointed out, there's a locational element to this. And are there any geography folks in the room? Excellent, yeah. So when we talk about climate change, it's really important to remember, this is a spatial question. 
Location matters. Not just where things are, but what they're connected to. What are the relationships, interrelationships, between those different things of interest? How are they linked? All right, does anybody know where Micronesia is? It's always in the middle of the map. If it's a good map that has Micronesia in the middle, we'll get to that. Here's Polynesia, Hawaii, New Zealand, Easter Island, so the giant triangle of the Pacific. We have Melanesia, Papua New Guinea over to Fiji. And last, the hero of our, of our story is Micronesia, that big open area in the middle where there's apparently no land. It, Micronesia as a region, as a region, is about as large as the 48 U.S. states, the lower 48. The land area of Micronesia is equivalent to that of Rhode Island. You take Rhode Island, put it in a Cuisinart or a food processor, scatter it from Maine to Florida, from LA to, to Washington, that's Micronesia. Tiny, tiny, tiny islands. Let's zoom in. Still can't see any land. You've got to zoom in a ways before you start seeing the land. All right, so Micronesia consists of a variety of countries, Palau, FSM, uh, it's in yellow, that's what we're going to talk about, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, Mariana Islands, Marshalls, Kiribati, and Nauru. A lot of island states within the region of Micronesia. The region is often conflated with the, the country of the Federated States of Micronesia. I'm just going to focus on FSM, or Federated States of Micronesia. There's a tremendous story in history here of how the Federated States of Micronesia came to be. It's ma uh, patterned or modeled after the United States of America. So it comes after World War II, reached its independence in 1986. Importantly, as a background to this story, is the idea that when it achieved independence in 1986, it established what is known as a compact of free association with the United States. What that deal was, what the United States now has, and in perpetuity until the agreement is, re is uh, reversed by both parties, unfettered access to the waters and airspace of Micronesia for the nuclear military forces without any advance notice to the Micronesian government. That's a tremendous advantage if you think in geopolitical terms. In return, the Federated States of Micronesia receives $120 million per year in aid. Importantly, skipping to this one, that aid is scheduled to end in the year 2023. So the purpose for saying that is that in addition to climate change challenges that Federated States of Micronesia is facing, it's also facing this background of loss of economic aid and support. Is this a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. 60% of the income from the country comes from U.S. aid. 67% of employment is due to that, 60, that money coming in. You cut out U.S. money, FSM is now in a very precarious position. If you really want to hear a good story, ask me about the Chinese government involvement at the end. But that's not where I'm going with this. But it's still a good story. Let me focus in on one state within the FSM. This is a far western state called Yap. And you, has anybody ever heard of Yap? It is the island of stone money. It's one of the most traditional cultures in, in Micronesia. And we're going to see pictures of it that it's actually a blend of traditional and modern. But it's a, it's a small island group that consists of one cluster of high islands, the Yap cluster over there in the top left, and 15 coral atolls scattered across 1,000 miles of ocean. So there's a, there's a dichotomy here of the high islands of Yap, which the maximum elevation is 177. I don't know the average, but the max is 177. And you have these coral atolls, which have a max elevation of about 5 meters, 15 feet, floor to ceiling in this room. So you have the high islands, and you have the vast majority of the islands, which are low, and coral atolls. Collectively, these coral atolls are called the outer islands. Yap is the economic, cultural, uh, cultural is pejorative, but ecological, or excuse me, economic, political, educational center of the state, even though it's in the corner. That's where the uh, majority of the population is, around 7,000 people. And 3,500 people are scattered around the outer islands. To give you a sense of what these outer islands look like, as you might expect from the Coral Atoll, they're tiny, less than a square mile, if you think in those terms. They're low, five meters elevation. They're isolated, very few resources. Woliai has about 1,000 people on it. That's the maximum population of an atoll in Yap. So there are not very many people scattered across wide areas of the Pacific. One of the points of this talk is about climate change. Well, climate change has been going on forever. The climate has never been static. It's always a dynamic system in which not just people, but other uh, species have lived since their formation on Earth. So what has this culture done in response to climate change in, hist in history? 
if I can get this to advance. One of the adaptive capacities that the culture developed was the ability to navigate huge distances across the ocean using nothing but stars, no GPS, no compass, but using the stars as a navigational aid. You may have, I don't know, if you, have you seen Moana? Classic documentary, right? <laughs> based on this ability to navigate across the open ocean using nothing but stars and an open outrigger canoe. This technology or this skill set was developed in Yap, in the state of Yap, particularly in the islands, outer islands of Sadawal, as a life necessity to get between islands when times got rough. When times got really rough, where would they go? Where, where would you go? If a hurricane came through, or a typhoon came through, a drought, you're probably going to go to some place with a mountain. You're going to go to Yap. That's a long way to go, but it's, a, it's worth it when you get there because there's larger island, more food, more everything. Thus developed the system of, re of reciprocity. Yap provides in time of need, and in return, the outer islands collectively delivered tribute in this symbiotic, roughly, economic system of tribute that the outer islanders brought to Yap, and in bad times, Yap provided harbor and safe um, haven, food, shelter for the outer islanders. And then when times got good, the Outer Islanders returned back home. But there was very much a give and take dynamism between that relationship between Yap and the Outer Islanders. Let's take a look at Yap. Yap is all the things that those Outer Islands are not. It's larger, although by our standards it's still small, 36 square miles. It's a really small island, but it's big comparatively. It's less low, so it's 177 meters max elevation. They had more resources, more people. Nowadays, in modern terms, more money, more economic power, more political power, more everything. That is the epicenter of the state. What I want to do is take you on a transect from east to west across the island of Yap. And this will provide, hopefully, some basis for us to move forward when we talk about climate change and adaptive capacity. So I'm going to take you across and I'm going to take, talk a little bit about the uh, culture and a little bit about the economy. Before I do that, let me throw out a, a, a local concept. It's not that different from what we think of in terms of sustainability, having economic, um, social, and ecologic components. That's sustainability, the triple bottom line, whatever, whatever phrasing you want to bring to it. It's essentially a balance between the economic, the environmental, and the social. The third Michol is a local expression of that. This is a cooking pot. And in the local vernacular, if, you, if your three stones supporting your Michol aren't in balance, your food will tip out and you will lose what you most value. So in the, in the local presentation of this idea, these three stones have to be in balance. They have to be at the same level of each other. And if not, there's an imbalance and thus you're going to lose your food. So let's take a quick look. Uh, coral reefs of a tropical Pacific island are as what you would expect, right? They're, they're robust, they're healthy. Uh, lots of coral, grouper, anemone, uh, manta rays. There's a resident popula population of manta rays, 14 feet wingspans of these incredible fish. Uh, many people, when they go to Yap, go for the scuba diving. As you move on to land, this is a busy day at the beach. Move inland, you get these giant banyan trees uh, that are wonderful uh, and just really, you know, just deep, deep, dark forest. Just one of my students, Dan, from New York. Uh, I'll explain my connection with the app here in a moment, but I do take students with me when I go. And the slide I want to dwell on is this slide of a traditional agro ecosystem. This is the food part of the story. This is the centerpiece of the Yaps, of Yaps adaptation to, to climate change. I'll walk you through it. There's a traditional stone path. This is a taro plant. Do you know taro? Taro is a really starchy tuber. It's like an unsweet sweet potato um, is what it is. But it is the heavy carb of their, of their diet. I see bananas growing, and there's other uh, vegetables and seasonings and spices growing around it. But it's an integrated agroecosystem maintained over thousands of years. Uh, archaeological evidence suggests that Yap was settled around 3,000 years ago, roughly 1,000 BC. So it's, it's, the people have lived there for a long, long time. Now, culturally, if anyone has heard of Yap, typically it's because of the stone money. I don't know if you know stone money. If you go to, you've been to Smithsonian? If you go into the Smithsonian, not on the mall side, but on the other side, there's a piece of Yap East stone money on display just as you, it's one of the first things you see as you go into the Smithsonian. Um, Yap is extremely protective of its stone money, and it's, um, but it was taken out post-World War II when, when things were just done. Uh, but that piece of stone money is now on permanent, they've made arrangement, permanent loan from the Yap state government. But stone money is one of the main uh, reasons people have uh, heard of Yap. 
what I want to do with these three slides is set up this idea that the culture of the app, as traditional as it is, still has a lot of modern elements to it. And you can see where I'm going with this slide in the bottom, pickup trucks and t-shirts from Kentucky. And there's a lot of modern remnants or modern elements to the culture. But let me show you a little video here uh, that shows you a traditional dance. And you heard maybe the audio before the talk started. So this, this traditional dance is a stick dance. It's one of the most famous dances on Yap. Uh, but it shows that the uh, Yappies value their culture and are working to maintain it across time. I have to fast forward it to get to the good part. So those dances have been passed down for hundreds, thousands of years. They are maintained by oral tradition and now written tradition and choreographed tradition, but they're part of Yap's culture. Another part of Yap's culture that's often hidden is the role of the traditional leadership. I mentioned that FSM is a really a product of the USA, but it's different. The USA has three branches of government, the executive, ju judicial, and the legislative, right? The FSM has four. That fourth branch is the traditional. On YAP, the Council of High Chiefs has veto power over the governor. So the, the chiefs have a, a, a tremendous amount of power over how things are done, both within the state of YAP and across municipalities, which are subsections, roughly counties of YAP. And what we see here is Charles Cheng, who's a, uh, who, he's passed away, but he was a good friend of mine. He's a high chief of one of the villages called Della Pebinau. And this is after Typhoon Sadal in 2004. Food was limited, maybe not that different from Hurricane Florence. Uh, in the coastal areas of the Carolinas. And what he's done is collect all this food to distribute. There's a strong notion of reciprocity. I help you, you help me. And this is a social contract that we've engaged in to maintain stability of the entire system. This reciprocity, my ar argument is, is the basis of the adaptive capacity for the island. So to your point, how is YAP or how, is these, how are these small islands doing it? They're doing it through a mix, a blend, an integration of tradition, tradition in the sense of reciprocity, but also now blended with modern geospatial science. That's the geography, that's where I come into the story, and I will in a little bit introduce myself and my role here in YAP, but I'm trying to set a context for just YAP by itself. But the notion of reciprocity, of mutual obligation between social parties is the foundation for YAP's adaptive capacity as it adjusts to climate change in the 21st century. If we're thinking about the economy of YAP, again, that, that three, uh, three, uh, the three stones of Nichol, what we have, this is a picture of Colonia, which is a main, uh, I wouldn't call it a city of YAP, but it's a main, main hub of YAP's activity. You see American Japanese cars, you see American Western buildings, uh, you'll see the uh, container ship offloading containers bought with money provided by the USA of A to provide their goods of food, of, of the cars, of appliances, of computers. They have nicer computers than I do because they, they have a lot of money to spend on these things. My favorite, though, is this picture I'm going to show you next. Um, I would argue for, for argument the idea that if you really want to learn what a culture is like, go to the frozen food section. And this is the frozen food section in the grocery store on, in Colonia on Yap. And there's a lot you can glean from this. Many, well, first of all, mini muffins are on sale. All right? So if you're a big mini muffin fan, this is a good place to go. You can see how much they are. They're on sale from 210 down to a buck 75. That seems pretty cheap. But the currency is in the US dollar. There's still a heavy US influence there. The products in the frozen section are from the United States. If you find eggs in there, which are kept in the freezer, that's the freezer loosely defined. But if you find eggs in there, they come from Oregon. They come from the Willamette Valley. All right, if you have an Oregon connection, they come from the Willamette Valley of Oregon. 
put on a plane and flown out. To, incredibly expensive way to provide food for people. The bread, the DiGiorno pizza. Really? Yeah. This is the, this is the mix of the old and the new on Yap. Okay, so what I've tried to do here is to give you a sense of place. Geography is about place. It's about location. It's about who lives there, not just what's there. What I'd like you to take away from this one section is the idea that Yap State, writ large, with the Yap cluster of islands and the outer islands, is a network system of people and history and reciprocity. There's a, there's a social contract and, a, and, a, and a, an agreement about how things should happen. It's adaptive over 3,000 years, and now the food and economy is driven by foreign aid. So there's a heavy influence of US government money to support the current living standard uh, of YAP. So the question on the table is how will YAP adapt to climate change? There's an economic subtext, but there's also a very real uh, effects that we're gonna see here in a second of climate change in these small islands. So let's change to our next frame, which is climate and climate change. Are you familiar with the IPCC? Some of you probably are. Anybody not familiar with the IPCC? the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Excuse me. The IPCC is the international body which has taken the responsibility and role of synthesizing all that's relevant and known about global climate change. Started in 1988. This is the 30th year anniversary. Uh, should be wearing a hat and blowing a horn. It's the 30th year anniversary of the IPCC. The most recent report came out in 2013, the assessment report number five, so AR5. What I'm gonna show you are graphs and, and quotes from that report. I'm not going to drag you through the whole thing, but I want to give you some understanding of climate change. And when we're thinking about, when we're thinking about climate change in the Pacific Ocean, <clears throat> there are very clear climate change related drivers that are expected and projected to change. And I have here with high confidence and robust evidence. So this is as certain as science gets. You know, science is never about 100 percent. It's about eliminating the things that aren't right and then looking at what's left over. But clearly, cyclones, increasing air and sea temperatures, and changing rainfall patterns are all projected to occur with high confidence and robust evidence as we go forward. But really, the impact that we're focused on is sea level rise. There is nothing so precious on small islands as land. And the one thing that will take your land away is the sea. Islanders know this innately. They know this because they live it. There are no non-coastal areas in a small island. Even as large as Yap or as big as Hawaii, the, the sea is the ultimate consumer of land. So let me show you three graphs here, three points to build this understanding of climate change as it's relevant to Yap. The first, and this is observed sea level rise, the first point is that sea level rise is accelerating. If we look at the early part of the 20th century, it's right increasing about a millimeter per year. Current global average is around three, and it's actually 3.1, 3.2 millimeters per year. And you might think three millimeters, which is essentially three dimes back to back to back. What difference does that make in an ocean that's thousands of feet deep? Well, it's not the average that we're interested in, it's the extremes, and it's also the cumulative effect. Three millimeters, three millimeters, three millimeters, it adds up over time. So the first point is that sea level rise is accelerating in rate on a global average. So globally, it's three millimeters per year. Second point to make is that the sea level rise observed is highly spatially variable. Even though the global average is 3.1 millimeters per year, that's just a global average. What we find, in fact, by looking at satellite altimetry, constantly examining with high precision the sea levels around the world, is that some areas are getting higher faster than others. Have you had a second to walk through the scale? What color is the most dramatic increase? White or pink, right? So this, this area here, is there any area that has that color in it? It's a quiz question. This is the final exam. In fact, there is an area on the map with that color. It's Micronesia. And Yap, boom right in the bullseye. On average, for YAP over the last 15 years, the rate of increase is 10 to 12 millimeters per year, whereas the global average is three. So we're looking at three to four, perhaps five times the rate of global average sea level rise increasing on YAP. If you're living on an atoll that's five meters high, <clears throat> it's real stuff. That's just point number two, it's spatially variable. This is now projected data, so looking into the future. If we project out into the future, what do we expect to see? 
if we're here, just before 2020, the projections according to the IPCC are what we already commonly know. That sea levels will continue to increase, perhaps at an exponential rate, right? That, that sweeping up curve, we don't know, but we certainly expect it to keep increasing as time moves forward. So what we see happening on YEP now is just a precursor for what is to come in the future. So sea level rise is accelerating. It's highly spatially variable with the maximum rates observed in Micronesia on YAP. And the third is that it's not going to stop. So this is a real issue that requires some response by the YAPEs. Oh, I just got an email. Would you mind if I? Oh, sorry. That's embarrassing. Let me give you two bottom lines. Two bottom lines here from the IPCC report. Saves you hours of reading and studying, as glorious as that might be. One is, given the inherent physical characteristics of small islands, which again are typically small, low, uh, exposed, and sensitive to climate change, the AR5, the assessment report number five, which is 2013, and the most recent one, reconfirms the, the emphasis added, so emphasis is on me. High level of vulnerability, there's that word again, right? Vulnerability, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. My point here, just to interject, because I'm in the room and IPCC isn't, I hope. This is a misuse of that word. What they're really talking about is exposure and sensitivity. My argument, again, is that adaptive capacity is really where the, the hallmark of the small Pacific Islands should be placed. That's, that's really what small Pacific Islands are about, is the ability to adapt. And blending that traditional culture with modern geospatial science will put them in a place that may help them see this out to its best possible outcome. Not perfect, but better than just simply waiting for the seas to wash up and uh, take away their land. The high level of vulnerability of small islands to multiple stressors, both climate and non-climate. And this is an interesting point that the, the stressors are not just climatic, that there's some inter interaction, there's some integration between the climatic impacts and the non-climatic impacts, that there's some crossover. So it's not just about sea level rise. It's about culture. It's about economy. It's about how people live. It's about behavior. So these are important outcomes of climate change, that we can't simply measure the impact of climate change by millimeters rise per year or temperatures added per day. We can, that's an in, incomplete description of the impacts of climate change, that it will have an outcome measured in terms of human behavior and human economy and human social interactions. Second main point, there's a lack of accurate, relevant, and island-specific data, either modeled or empirical, available to quantify these general character, characterizations. In other words, we know what's true for the population of islands, but we really don't have any good data on the individuals. There's a huge data gap for how individual islands will respond, both their exposure, their sensitivity, and their adaptive capacity. We know generally what's going on. I'm talking as if I'm the IPCC. We know what's going on, but we don't have the data on small islands to really complete the picture in a, in a detailed quantitative way. Well, this, if you're a scientist, if you're an academic, what you really enjoy is when people tell you, this is fundable. You can get money for this. Right? This is a need that has to be met. This is something we don't know that we need to know. So a lack of accurate, relevant, and island-specific data available to quantify these general characterizations. This is where I start to become relevant to the story, because now I'm going to take you back to YAP. If we look at the state of YAP again, and the outer islands <coughs> and the big islands of YAP, what do we know about the outer islands? Very well documented for the outer islands. The impacts. Erosion, degraded freshwater, degraded reefs, and degraded food production. Well documented, generally for atolls. If you're on those atolls and that happens, I've already asked you, where are you going to go? You're going to go to Yap. Why? Because of that social contract, that notion of reciprocity that obligates the people of Yap to host you. Sort of like your cousins. Even if you don't like your cousins, you've got to let them in. Yeah, you know, you got to let them in. So I'm not sure if Hurricane Florence affected you here, but it probably affected someone you know. And you probably said, hey, if you have an issue, come on up. Stay with us. That's what's going on in, in Micronesia. So there's around 3,500 3, people living in the outer islands, 7,000 people living on Yap. 
the population of the outer islands is actually increasing, but for an unexpected reason. The men are already migrating to Yap for economic opportunities. Meanwhile, the women and the population rate is increasing because when the men come home, hey, good to see you again. <laughs> Boom, lots of kids. I got to go back to Yap, I'll see you. And so the, the population demographics is shifting to women and children, and the men are migrating to Yap. What's unexpected is how long that will stay, and then eventually the women and children are going to come too. The island, outer islanders do not want to leave. They do not want to leave. They're like those people on the coast that they find on the rooftops. They don't want to leave, and I'm not judging them. I'm just saying there's a, there's a certain value of where you are from that keeps them there as long as possible. Okay. So the app and outer island vulnerability change, just to hammer this home again, the exposure may be the same. Sensitivity is greatly different. The adaptive capacity is linked. That the adaptive capacity of these outer islanders is rooted in history, which forces them or encourages them to migrate to Yap. There's a social connection, historical connection, there's an obligation for the Yapis to host them. The Yapis, meanwhile, on their side of the equation, says it's not just us that we have to think about. We're not just planning for 7,000 people, we have to plan for the outer islanders as well. They are our responsibility. It's like your cousins are coming to stay, but they're not leaving. They're never leaving. Once the outer, outer islanders come and arrive on Yap, they're probably there for good. So this is part of the adaptive equation for the people of Yap. The question becomes, what happens to these three stones of Nichol in the context of climate change? And what I want to do now is transition to the response. To set that up, here are the, here are the questions that come out of what I've said. How do climate and culture interact to affect Yap's vulnerability, specifically the adaptive capacity. It's a climate and culture intersection that fascinates me. It's not just about millimeters and degrees and points this and that. It's about humans, environment working together and humans adapting to that climate context. Does Yap's culture help or hurt its food security? Because when we break it down to brass tacks, this is what we've got. It's reasonable to expect that the food demand is going to go up because of the increased population, but the supply is going to go down due to salinization of the nearshore food production zones, which I'll show you in a second. I showed you that agro-forest or agro-eco um, agro, um, agro uh, food production system with a taro. That's really close to the shore. So increased food demand, decreased food supply, and what adaptations are possible? Those are the questions that I'm curious about as a researcher uh, that I'm working on with the people of Yap. So that's kind of the response. So I teach at Queens, as Tim said. I've been there since 1998. And starting in 2000, I started to go to the island of Yap. In 2001, I started taking students. And I've been taking students almost every year since. So we go, there's a group of 12 of us. We live in a village. We do village work. We partner with local government and non-governmental uh, non organization um, groups to do the projects that they want to get done. So we don't go in with a research agenda. It's not about publications. It's not about satisfying the requirements of the grant. All of this is funded by the university. So we go to help them get done what they want to get done on their terms. They prioritize, they own, they keep, they monitor. We're just, in vernacular, we're not steering the canoe, we're just paddling. They're setting the course of where we're going to go. And so I think that's important to note because we, I don't own the projects that I'm about to describe. They own the projects that I'm about to describe. But none of it would be possible without my students and faculty co-leaders. My students are the best, apart from Richmond students. Whew, that was close, right? Best in the world. I mean, I love my students. Uh, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, half of these, this is an older picture, half of these, these kids are married with kids themselves at this point. But um, nothing that I do here would not happen without uh, the hard work of my students and co-leaders. So breaking it down to basic questions again, Here's where we're going. Where are people growing taro? If this is about food security, if this is about adaptive capacity for climate change, where are people growing taro? And is it getting salty? Those are good basic questions to start with. Can we put it on a map? And the answer to that is yes. And last question, where else can people grow taro? And a lot of the analysis I'm going to show you is a product of GIS. And I'm, I'm assuming at this point, are you familiar with GIS? Geographic information, lots of nods, smiles. Good, it's the greatest thing in the world, love it. Glad you're exposed to it and using it. 
Uh, give a shout out to funding sources for service, uh, WK Kellogg Foundation and the Duke Energy uh, Company provided uh, money or supplies along the way. And so now let me take you back to YAP with a different lens. This is a DEM or digital elevation model of YAP that is broken down and so, so shows the bones of YAP. So no uh, roads, no uh, satellite image, just the, the elevation. And you can see that the wide range in elevation down at the, the southern tip is quite low. And you, if you remember the big banyan tree, right? It's kind of up there, I can't reach it, but it's up in that high mountain. It looks like the Swiss Alps, but there's no skiing on the app. And it's, it's a uh, nice way to frame your understanding. So immediately you start to think that there are different levels of variability, or vulnerability, excuse me, and it's spatially variable. So some areas are more vulnerable than others. If we now overlay the satellite image to make it look good, <clears throat> what we did is to map every tarot spot patch, excuse me, every tarot patch on the app. This is an anecdotal uh, um, data collection. So we hired a local woman. She went from the top of the northernmost islands called Rumung and went village to village. We interviewed 117 out of 120 village uh, areas where they grow taro and put that on the map. If you see that one spot, I don't have a, I don't have a, a red laser point, but you see that spot in the southern part of Rumung where there's no green dots? That village as a village chose to bail out. Talk about adaptive capacity. Do you know where they went? <clears throat> Alaska. I don't know why, but the entire village got on a plane and went to Alaska. So that's why there are no tarot spots on that part of the southern tip of that little island. So the green represents all of the tarot patches on the island of, on the main islands of Yap. There were 2,707 of these, and they were collected anecdotally using a paper map and the uh, interviewer said, where do you grow taro? And the person kind of looked at the roads and the streams and said, right here. The next question was, are they salty? And I apologize if anybody's red, green, colorblind. Anybody? Good. You're very polite. But the red dots are the salty taro. So here's my teacher question. What's the pattern of the salty taro? Is there a, is there a pattern to, their, to the dot location? coast. Strongly linear, right? And I'm going to draw your attention to this one here. So it's, as you would expect, that they're, that they're near the coast, it would be, would be reported as salty. And I said, that's interesting. What elevation is that? So I got out the DEM that we started with, plotted out five meters in elevation, 15 feet, floor to ceiling. The blue line represents the five meter elevation zone. What well, we found out that in the perception of the Yappies, taro grown as high as five meters elevation was being impacted by sea level rise. That was way beyond our expectation, way beyond our prediction of what sea level rise might be doing on these small islands. Five meters is a significant part of the island, as you can tell just by visually looking at the blue around the island. So we said, that's really interesting. But you know what, as scientists, Anecdotal data are a good start, but they certainly don't win the day. We need to validate those, those reports. So we started to ask and frame basic questions. What's the tarot patch location? Can we get a GPS on this thing? And actually XY where that tarot patch is. Can we test the salinity with a high-end probe? YSI is a brand name. It's a, it's a very high-end salinity probe to really quantify, remember that IPCC charge, to quantify these relationships. We're going to take an YSI probe and quantify the salinity and match it to a fixed location. Can we take a drone and fly it to get the elevation and the stress level by measuring how green the taro is and start to get an understanding of not just salinity levels but impact on food production? And can we correlate the stress and the salinity levels? This is the plan. So we worked with a local municipality it's called Tamil, and right in the yellow box. And I'm going to show you what we found. It wasn't what we expected. How's that for a cliffhanger? It's a teaser, I guess. So in the upper left, we have the anecdotal data. And it doesn't show up well. You, might, you folks might be OK. But it's the same data we just saw. The red dots are smaller now, but they're in the same location. This is just the anecdotal data, treat, anecdotal data treated as a hypothesis, if you will, of what the expected results might be. These are the field measurements. And the field measurements, have you ever worked in a field it's, it's tough. It's tough to get permission to go access people's land. It's uh, very overgrown. It's difficult to trudge all your equipment in there. It's raining three days of the week, so you can't go, and you need 
So a guide to take you there. It's very difficult to collect data in the field. It's not, not as simple as just taking a satellite image. But we measured uh, these tarot patches. Green is less than one uh, part per thousand, PPT salinity. Yellow is two, and red is uh, over two. Just for context, ocean's about 35. So this is not, you would taste the salt in an over two, but it wouldn't necessarily be, you know, salty, salty. It wouldn't be ocean salty. And so what do you notice? That a lot of the areas that are below the five meters are really not being reported as salty at all. The second thing that we discovered is that it's really difficult to locate these anecdotally reported tarot patches because those are just X's on a map. When we try to go out with a GPS, we don't know if, if you can see that. Uh, it's a little bit difficult in this, but you might be able to see the, the green square or green cross there. Which of those two in the corresponding location that green cross represents? Is it the one that was reported as salty or the one that was reported as not salty? So working in the field is difficult, and these results were really not very conclusive. So we have to go back, and that's what we're gonna do. Um, what we've done, I should have shown you these slides before, what we did is uh, sink PVC pipe in each tarot patch that we could, and then we followed up uh, with a student interviewing the local landowner. You know, what's going on? Do you mind if we go in and, and check your, your tarot? And what we found was not at all what we expected. The vast majority were not salty, even though anecdotally they were considered to be salty. So it's messy. Right. The second way it's messy is with a drone. So when we tried to use a drone to, to get the elevation and, and stress level of the plants, what we see in that, if you can read in the orange circle, that tarot patch is located in an overhung area of trees. So we couldn't actually see the tarot patch with the drone. When we go back in 2019, which we will in May, we're going to have to reconfigure our methods to make sure that we can get uh, what we want to get out of this. Because right now it's difficult. Okay, last question here. Where else can people grow taro? So if the, if the, uh, a lot of the taro patches are being reported as salty, what's the next step? Where else can they go? <clears throat> if we look at the area here, that's what we call prime taro. That's good soils, good slope. That's all it is, classic GIS exercise. Just looking at the polygons, looking at the areas that have the desirable slope and desirable soils, we can see that there's a fair bit of land that's ideal for growing taro. The problem is it's 67% of it is under five meters in elevation. That's not good, especially when you have 3,500 people coming for dinner. It's really problematic to try to figure out how they're going to do that. So there has to be some other way. And one of the ways that the APIs is, are working with, and this is really an answer to your question, is by lifting the level of the land, by raising up. And what they've done, this is a, a stream area here, but what they've done is raise the level of the stream bank. I don't know the distance in this particular case, call it three meters, four meters, above what it ordinarily would be. They're trying to outgrow sea level rise. They're not going to escape it, but what they can do is adapt to it by raising up the level of their food production so that the food is not subject to uh, salt water coming in from underneath. Okay, so next steps. Again, I mentioned we're going to go back in 2019. So the first thing we need to do is to make sense of the measured data. Go back into the village of Tamil. We have more PVC pipes that have been put in over the last year. We need to go out and measure those. We need to understand GRIAP's groundwater dynamics. I have a colleague from Australia coming with us on this trip. He's a groundwater hydrologist who focuses on small islands in the Pacific, so he's perfectly suited to come in and offer judgment and make a model of GRIAP's groundwater system, which is going to be fantastic. We need to examine salinity data at the village and municipality level. So when we think about, and this connects with the last point number four, we need to break this down into the chief in the back of the pickup truck, Charles. Those chiefs are responsible for providing for food in their village and in their municipality. That's the level at which YAP's social system operates. Thinking about it as an island system of the entire island is helpful, but only a first start. What we need to do is go back and think about it in terms of the village level and the municipality, because that's the internal food distribution system that has to be used to overcome food scarcity. Okay, so as we come into the end of this, let me leave you with a couple of closing thoughts and then I'll open it up to questions. First is that impact versus adaptation has been happening on YAP for 3,000 years. This notion of 
climate change being a new threat is true, but only in as much as it's a rate and, and duration of change. The people on YAP have been dealing with changes in climate and social structure for 3,000 years. This is not necessarily a new challenge. What's different about it is the rate and the duration of that challenge. And last, YAP's future is going to have to be a blend of the traditional and the modern. This integration of modern geospatial science with cultural heritage, the traditional knowledge versus modern techniques, is going to have to be enough, or else otherwise people of YAP and the other islands across the Pacific are going to have to relocate. But I'll tell you, they're going to be just like the outer islanders. They're going to, be, they're going to wait to the last possible moment before they do that. And with that, I'll turn it over to you and see what questions you have or comments. Thank you. One question. Sir. You're having a, high, uh, <coughs> pardon me, a hydrology uh, expert come in and take yep. a look at the uh, groundwater. Is there a concern with the influx of people from the outer islands to uh, Yap, um, the increase in population there impacting uh, hydrology along with the uh, uh, salinization of it. So outstripping the so supply or uh, demand outstripping supply. Yeah, so there was a survey done. And one of the challenges of working in these islands is a paucity of data. There's just not a lot of good numbers out there to, to draw from. The groundwater survey that was done by the USGS back in 1990, so this is old at this point, had a, I forgot the numbers, but it, it was a, as a supply enough to support 9,500 people on the island. So well above the current level of 7,000, but not enough for the 11,000 if everybody were to relocate to YAP. So generally what we can take from that is the groundwater supply currently is far in excess of current demand. But the hope is that if they manage it, that it'll be enough to handle 11,000. So then you get into conservation. You know, like with any developing country, you've got leaky pipes, you've got a lot of waste in the water system. But right now, that's not, ma that's not a major issue, is the availability of groundwater. Other questions? Ma'am, uh, sorry, not you. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I'm making this up, but isn't there salt resistant taro? Can they like, exploit that? You're not making that up, and they're developing salt, salt resistant taro. The challenge is whether, whether the flavor will be culturally acceptable. So the uh, different islands, Hawaii is experimenting with salt-resistant taro, Palau is experimenting with salt-resistant taro, but it's not the same species, not the same strain or variety that the locals value. So taro is to, <clears throat> uh, I'll make this kind of analogy, taro is to yap what sweet tea is to the south. And don't give me bad sweet tea. It is not worth my time. You call it, you know, I don't know what your favorite, if it's Bojangles or whatever, but don't give me bad sweet tea. I don't care if it's climate, Wonderful or not, I'm not going to drink it. So it's it's that kind of cultural identity is rooted in the in the in the species of taro, the colocasia that they have. But it, it could be it could be it could be the solution, or one part of it. It's just not going to be well accepted initially. Yeah. You had a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it is really important, and that's why I make a, a, I, I stress that we are paddlers and not steerers of the canoe, right? Because there are plenty of student groups, and not a lot to go to Yap, but to go to developing countries, and it's, they, they descend with good intention, but with bad outcomes. So they'll outstrip the local supply of fresh water or food. They'll, they'll uh, make people uh, leave or abandon their work responsibilities to come play host for the time that they're there. So a lot of negative outcomes that come with student or any you know foreign groups that come in i've worked hard to not do that anytime we come it is um there are some good things about that too and that is uh, I, I tend to think of analogies when do i vacuum my house when people come over right that's when i vacuum my house so it's I'm, i like it when they come partly because it forces me to vacuum it forces me to do the things that i like i need to do no i don't like to vacuum please but I, I do need to do that stuff. <clears throat> These are projects that need to be done on YAP, even if they're not front and center. Eventually, they need to be done. And having a group come in from outside can be a spark that encourages them to set aside the week or two weeks that we're there to figure this out. Otherwise, it just keeps manana, manana, and it just keeps, yeah, but there is that balance. It's, a, it's really a good point. It's a balance that you have to maintain, and it's hard. 
David. So climate change seems like the long term, but you talked about a game changer in 2023, is that what you Yeah, talking? exactly. So that seems to be a huge issue that's going to happen in the next five years. Yes. The U.S. is going to potentially pull out of an agreement that's essentially keeping the whole system economically afloat. Yes. That is, that is and, and if you were to go to Micronesia, if you go to YEP or FSM, that is much more on the front burner than climate change because that's now within five years. Um, if you can imagine having $120 million, which goes to support the country's, and it's 60% of the, the country's income taken away, what do you do? Well, what they're trying to do is sweeten up the relationship with China. And the, what they're trying to do is play China off the United States. So China, uh, not to get, I'm not a geopolitical expert, but just from this small window of yet, China is now putting uh, um, out its influence into the Pacific in a way that it hadn't done in the 20th century, <clears throat> including into Micronesia by building schools, runways, hospitals, lots of needed infrastructure because the United States, which previously had sway in this region, didn't. And so China is coming in and saying, we have lots of money and resources, and we're going to make you, you know, give you the things that the United States has not. And on YAP, specifically what they're doing is building proposed a 1,000-room hotel complex, which would provide employment, tax revenue, that kind of thing, which would replace the lost revenue from the USAID. And so the, the Federated States and Micronesia government and the YAP state government are looking and hosting Chinese influence and saying goodbye to the United States. In the United States, I don't think, well, I'll, I'll say one thing at a time. I don't think FSM wants to um, abandon its relationship. I think they're playing one side off the, off the other until they get what they want. And what strikes me as crazy, right, is this, this tit for tat is happening in the context of the two greatest power contributors to yeah. The world in a place that is one of the most susceptible places to Yeah. There's a lot of irony here, right? So these islands contribute a fraction of a fraction of a millionth of a percent of CO2 that's causing climate change, and yet they are the ones who are most impacted by it. Um, and so, in their sense, and I'm, I'm speaking for them, which is unfair, they're going to get what they can while they can and make the most out of it because they, they, they don't have a voice necessarily in, in the United Nations. You know, every climate change, meaningful climate change proposal in the UN gets shot down or, or weakened to the point of being meaningless. So they're going to get what they can while they can. Um, and if that means upsetting the United States, then so be it. Yeah. Good questions. Um, maybe behind you. Sorry. Everybody's in a row. Um, yes. How did you first start getting involved in Yeah, that's a good question. So personal history. Uh, while I was doing my PhD, uh, I got my PhD in forest hydrology at Oregon State. Uh, the University of Oregon had a program called the Micronesia South Pacific Program funded by USAID that put people with technical skills in the islands of Micronesia that requested them. I knew a little bit about GIS, at least I joked that I at least knew how to spell it. Right? This is 1995. There wasn't a lot to GIS in 1995, but I at least knew how to spell it. I knew what it was. I went over to, to uh, Micronesia and started getting involved. Right after I finished my PhD, I started teaching at Queens. Queens has an international program funded by the school. And I said, hey, rather than taking the kids, kids to go to Europe, why don't we take students and go to Micronesia and actually make a positive difference? So that's really quickly how I got involved in that. But it's been a tremendous relationship ever since. Yeah. Other questions? Having spent so much time on the ground, yep. what's, what's your sense of getting back to Canada? I have this question about the um, sense of the, the small, their, their voice their voice in the global community? Does it feel, is it very frustrated? Does it, does it feel like their voice is being heard? Or no. There's a frustration that only comes when, when, you, when two things happen. You know you're right, and nobody's listening. Have you ever had that happen? Ask my wife, <laughs> right? She knows she's right. I never listen. I'm always, but it, it's that frustration that would, and their lives depend on it. So they're absolutely in the right here. Nobody would seriously deny them that, that they're not, they're not the cause, but they're receiving the, the harmful impacts of climate change. But nobody's paying attention to them. Why? Because it's too expensive or it's too whatever to deserve serious attention. So it, it, they are extremely frustrated. That's, to David's point, or to my answer to David's question, that's why they feel no compunction about suddenly cozying up with a totally you know, animus partner with, with China as opposed to their longstanding relationship with the US. 
English is an official language in Micronesia. So there are multiple languages, but English is the common denominator within the whole country. So they're, they're, and they're deeply steeped in American tradition. Schools, Peace Corps, government, you know, they have EPA offices, U.S. Forest Service offices. I mean, they're, they're essentially outposts of the United States, even though they're a, they're a sovereign country, but they're willing to give that up to associate with China. Ma'am. Have I been able to bring people from Micronesia back to the U.S.? No, I've been able to take your research that you have, um, that you've done there and correlate it with some of those vulnerable areas in the United States. Um, I have not, to just be honest with you. For me, this is all-consuming. This is where I spend, you know, my, my professional research energy is entirely focused in Micronesia. Um, I have not... I wish I were two of me. I wish I had more time. I'm really slow is my, my issue. I just am incredibly glacial, which is ironic, you know, working in the tropics. But I'm very, very slow at what I do. And everything I do is focused on in Micronesia. There are analogs, though, in the United States of island communities having to relocate. In Louisiana, for example, Florida, they're, you know, they're, they are being forced to relocate. My point is that it's easier in the United States because the, the area is just down the road, quite literally. You know, it might be a bridge, it might be a boat, but it's, it's within 100 miles. And everybody speaks English, and it's roughly the same culture. But in Micronesia, what you're losing is indigenous cultures that have been there for 3,000 years. So it's, I wish I could, but I just, I just haven't. So in the interest of time, we will stop there. Uh, we're going to hang around for a few minutes. So if you yep. have some questions, you want to talk to Rachel, you'd be happy. Uh, let's thank uh, Peter. Thank you.